Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online every Saturday at 1215, and we are getting ready to read God's Word. Now, one thing you will find, there are things that God blesses, and there are things that God refrains from blessing, and we have to watch our P's and Q's. Why? Because we can contaminate a very good thing, knowingly or unknowingly. So let's get on with where that comes in at, because God gave me the scriptures, and we are getting ready to go into it right now. Haggai chapter 2. That's in the Old Testament, for those of you who don't know the Bible that well. Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 1. All right, and we stop whenever he says stop. Got it? Got it. All right, here we go. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Jerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. By the way, a lot of this is a prophetic reference to what happens in the book of Revelations for those who may not catch it. All right. So we are, this is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ and him reigning over the nations. All right, listen. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace saith the Lord of hosts. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law. If one, now this is it right here, listen y'all. If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then saith Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touches any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people. And so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. And that which they offer there is unclean. And now I pray you consider this day and upward from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of God. Now, I think I'm going to stop right here because this, no, I'm going to read. Okay, Lord, I'll read. Since those days were, when one came to an heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to a press fat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. 
Consider now from this day upward, from the four and twentieth day of the of the ninth month, even from the day of the foundation of the Lord's temple was made. Consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yet, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth from this day forth, I, from this day, I will bless you. Now, the reason I want to stop here is because the main thing that we're dealing with is not really getting the fact that sometimes as we walk with the Lord, we unknowingly contaminate the way. It's almost, if you could picture a surgeon getting ready to go in and do uh, a, a sensitive surgery on a person's body, and they have gotten, you know, they got dressed for the occasion, but they may be uh, getting over, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to paint the picture, so let me f flow with my imagination. Go with me on this. Imagine the surgeon, the top-notch surgeon now, but he had an argument with his wife the night before, and he went out and got drunk. So now he's waking up with a hangover. Uh-oh. Now, you know, a hangover is going to impede your judgment, your coordination, everything. Thank God I've never had one. So, you know, y'all can fill me in in the comments section later. But the point is, there is, an, there is a hindrance there because everything is not working at an optimum level. On top of that, let's say that he gets through scrubbing and he's ready to have his gloves put on and he's all nice and, and sterile. But he all of a sudden, because he's been around some folks that may have had uh, a cold or a flu and he feels a sneeze coming and he's on his way out into the, surg the surgical room and he doesn't feel like going back in and scrubbing again and he coughs and sneezes all at the same time. And all that spray gets on his glove that he's getting ready to touch up on a body with in surgery. But he doesn't go back and take the glove off because he's still dealing with the hangover. He's mad at his wife and he's still trying to get sober. So what happens? He has now contaminated the sterile area. Think about that. What God is trying to say is once you contaminate, okay, let's go into a little science real quick. So you see what I mean about how a little contamination goes a long way. When I was in junior high school, the, in taking science, the teacher instructed us to scrub our hands. Scrub, 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 scrub. And then we drive with a regular paper towel. And we even put alcohol. I mean, we did everything to make sure our hands were as squeaky clean as possible. Check this out. Talking contaminants now. She had us take our thumb or whatever finger we chose and put our fingerprint at the base of a Petri dish. She covered that Petri dish or didn't cover it. That part I don't remember. But she put that Petri dish in a dark area for three days. And when we came back to the class to see what happened with that Petri dish, each one of us, it had our names on it. We pulled our Petri dish out. What was on that Petri dish? A fingerprint? No. Mold. There was a growth of bacteria. I was so shocked. We washed our hands. We scrubbed. And she was teaching us about how bacteria a non-sterile environment, how bacteria grows in a non-sterile environment. Now, the Petri dish was sterile. Our hands were washed and scrubbed, but there was still bacteria because they were not sterilized with the right type of formula. So what happens? It grew in the Petri dish. And guess where it? the reason they put it in the dark? Because bacteria grows the fastest in the dark. Think of that now. Think of that. You know where I'm going? 
That's where sin can creep into our hearts when we allow ourselves to live in the shadows of Satan and his sin. When we live in the shadows of other people and their sin, things start to rub off on us because we're in an unclean environment. We may not be there with the intent of committing a sin, but sin can so easily be lodged in our hearts when we are around angry people, when we are around mean people, when we are around gossipers, when we are around people who like to be sly, slick, and wicked, and we find ourselves being tempted with some of the things they live in. It's just natural for them. But because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have a new nature. So we're more bent on righteousness. However, sin is ever with us. All we have to do is lower our God, our guard, not God, our guard, G-U-A-R-D. And before you know it, we're being tempted with the same sins. If I'm hanging around my family, for example, and I tell you, my family, they laugh, joke, and cuss. They cuss like sailors. If I hang around them too long, when I'm talking, I'll find some of those words popping in my head. Why? Because I've been in that unclean environment with unclean language. So that's why I guard who I hang with. I guard who I who I go out with, who I, I chat long term with and, and uh, frequently, because I want to make sure that I'm not allowing a crack in that door for sin to start slithering back into my life. See, I don't trust myself. Now you may trust yourself, but I trust God and I know God can help me stay on the straight and narrow, but it's not a tightrope walk because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit changes our nature and makes living holy much easier and much more desirable. So now here's the point <clears throat> with that contaminant thing. Sometimes we don't know how we can allow the contaminants to come in. So let's say we get into an altercation with somebody in the church and somebody does something that's offensive to us. Here's one way that a contaminant can get in. If you refuse to forgive them, if you get on the phone and talk to Sally Sue and Brother Appleseed and Sister Watermelon and Cousin Frankfurter, and you're on this phone talking about, you know what they did? You know what they said? You know, I mean, I hate them. I wish, you know, I mean, you know, God don't like ugly. I'm going to make sure that, that they know that they offended me. And you walk around with this chip on your shoulder and this attitude rolling around in your eyes. Your facial expression exudes the resentment you have in your heart. And then what happens is you told this one, that one, that one, that one. They all go to the same church or they work at the same workplace. And you got folks looking at the one that offended you as if they're offended. Now they're angry with them as well. See how the mold begins to grow? See what I mean? Contaminants. It spreads. Just like a virus, it spreads. So we have to be careful when we're upset, you know, we go to godly counsel. That's fine. That's biblical. We go to God. That's fine. That's definitely biblical. But we don't get on the phone and tell somebody, I think they lied to me. I think they're just an, a full-blown liar. I don't like the way they talk to me. They think they're better than I am. You don't know what they think. So why are you passing judgment? Hmm? Why are you passing judgment? You don't know what they think. You don't live with them. You weren't raised with them. This person is somebody that goes to the church you go to, or they work at the job you work at. You only see them a certain percentage of your life, but you think you know what's in their heart. No. They might be upset at their child for acting up. 
They might be upset at their boss for mistreating them or passing over them after all the sacrifices they made. And you catch them at an odd, at an odd moment when they might be short in court. And court, whatever that word is, can't even think of it right now. But they might be short with you. Their tone might not be that friendly, right? And you may ask them a question and they might be thinking about this situation and they tell you yes or no. And you're talking about that situation. So you're talking apples and oranges and they're so occupied and preoccupied with what's bugging them. Then you find out there's no truth in that because they're talking about what's over there. You're talking about what's over here. So they're not answering you according to what you asked. They're answering you according to what popped in their mind because they're preoccupied. So what ends up happening? Now you have an attitude because you found out something different. And you think they're lying to you. You think they're fabricating. You think they're patronizing you. No. See, that's how misconceptions arise. Misconception comes from disappointment and a miscommunication. And instead of straightening out that communication, talking with them and saying, okay, what did you mean when you said so-and-so? Because did you understand when I asked you blah, blah, blah? And what happens? No. If you talk about it, they'll, you might find out both of you misunderstood each other. Now you can get it straight. But if you run with that mistake, honest mistake they made, and you're on the phone talking to Brother Appleseed, talking to the head of the of, of this department and the head of that department, talking to your cousin, talking to your neighbor, and you're calling this person a liar, straight out liar. You're accusing them without getting your facts straight and making sure that they got their facts straight. That's how mold grows. That's how the body of Christ gets contaminated. Because of how we handle misunderstanding, miscommunication, how we handle offenses. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, for those of you listening in my church, this has nothing to do with any conversation that took place within this week. This is what God is showing me is going on in the body of Christ. That's what this is dealing with. How easily mold, contaminants, unclean spirits can weasel their way because of the way we treat each other. And see, some of you in the body of Christ, you think, you honestly do think that there are big eyes and little U's, and you're one of the big eyes. So you feel like you must patronize the little U's. And while you're patronizing them in your spirit, you don't recognize you are disrespecting them. You have contempt for them. You look down on them. You don't see it, but God does. They feel it. And they're trying their best to forgive you every time. But you keep doing it over and over and over and over. And some of you have been successful in driving people away from the Lord and the body of Christ rather than pulling them further in, getting closer to God. Why? Because of the way you mishandle people, the body of Christ. You cut the wound open, and then you put salt in it. And the way you treat them, they'll say something and you're like, oh yeah, so-and-so, and you dismiss them and go on with the person you deem as important because you're loaded with the spirit of partiality. So you've got the big eyes over here and the little you's you keep over in the corner because as far as you're concerned, you're the head honcho. You know who's who and what's what. And what God is trying to show you is no, baby, you're the little one. You are the little you because your spirit is puny and you nitpick over puny, insignificant, petty things. And you make a big mountain out of little molehills because you are small. Your mindset is small. Your spirit is small and you walk around contaminating. Mm. You know, the scripture that talks about, um, 
many thereby be defiled. Mm. Talking about this, that root of bitterness that springs up in you. And see, when you have roots of bitterness in your spirit, and they involve 10,000 people on the outside of your circle, but you're in this circle, it still affects how you treat them. And how you treat them affects how they walk with the Lord. So, because of the roots of bitterness that are in you, many thereby end up being defiled because you have contaminated your sphere of influence by the way you treat people based on the bitterness that you have harbored in your heart for years, decades, almost a century for some of you. Because why? Why is that bitterness there? Because you refuse to forgive. That's why. And what does the Bible say about that? If you don't forgive, neither will your father forgive you. See, forgiving doesn't mean putting yourself in that situation over and over again. Forgiveness means forgiveness. You don't hold it against them anymore. You move on. Like Kathy said, free. You free yourself from that. You cut the umbilical cord to that bitterness and you move on. They're fine. You're fine. Now you move on. That doesn't mean you have to have breakfast with them once a month or once a year for that matter. But you forgive them. And if you see them on the road and their tire is flat, you automatically want to help them. Why? Because there's no animosity. Animosity breeds mold. You hear me? So now let's go on to Acts chapter 5. Because one of the things that breeds mold as well is deceit. Hmm. A false presentation. One of the things that breeds mold is dishonesty. So let's go to Acts chapter 5. We're not going to be long on this. Acts chapter 5. Let me make sure we are recording. I think we are. Yes. Okay. Acts chapter 5. And we are reading, starting at verse 1. This won't be long. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Now, let me share this before I go any further. It's not what you do with what you got. It's how you present it. There's a thing called misrepresentation where you put up a facade and you present it as gold when you really when it really is gold plated. What God is saying before I even get into this, if it's gold plated Present it as gold-plated. It's fine. You're free to do it. It belongs to you. Present it for what it is, not for what you want, not for what you want people to think it is. Because when you lie to them, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. Here we go. Verse two, and kept back part of the price. So they sold a possession. They kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy or, you know, within the secrets, she knows what's going on, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, they were free to give 10%, 2%, 1%, and keep the rest for themselves. They were free to do that. This is where they went wrong, and I'll share it with you in a minute. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it, it remained, was it not thine own? In other words, he could have done whatever he wanted. But what he did and what he told them were two different things. So let me explain. Let me break this down so I can make it plain. He had land. He made it as if he sold all of the land and gave all the proceeds to the apostles. They didn't have to do that. But that's what they said they did. That was the sin. Not keeping back part of it. That was not the sin. It was misrepresenting what they did. So he says, while it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? 
thou hast lied unto men. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. The boy died. And great fear came among all them that heard these. All right. Now, and the young men arose and wound, <clears throat> wound them up and carried them out and buried him. And it was about the pace of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her. In other words, he asked her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, oh, yeah, for so much. Now, if she had said, uh, no, it wasn't sold for that much. It was sold for this much. And this is what we chose to give you. She would have been able to walk away just fine. But she lined up with her husband's deceit with that level of deception. She joined in on his mischief. And then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at her feet and yielded up the ghost. Girlfriend died. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Now, this is what I want to share with you. We tell little white lies. Mm -hmm. We do little deceptive things. We'll paint a picture and make ourselves look like an angel. I've been seeing it for the last two months. It's been like crazy watching the saints paint these, these pictures of themselves. It's the craziest thing to watch. And they don't even get what they're doing. They don't even understand. Or they will get, be given a chance to show mercy. But because they made it and you haven't, they're going to make you toe the line. But they got mercy every step of the way getting theirs. We don't realize how those, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, y'all. See, it's not just the act. It's not just what people see. It's what's lodged in the heart. What do you, you know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. Well, there are times some of you disrespect each other left and right. And you don't realize that that is not pleasing to God. But you feel like you have a right. You have a right based on your, uh, what's the word? Based on your pedigree, based on your credentials, hmm. all that you have earned, all that you came through to get what you got. But you're looking at someone else who can't seem to get it together. So you look at them and say, mm, I know they don't mean what they're doing. But you know what God said to a friend of mine years ago? This has stopped her from passing judgment. One of the men in our church had a problem with drinking. And he was constantly hitting that altar. This thing went on for three, four, five years. Hitting that altar, confessing to his weakness. But if you knew his wife, you would understand what drove him to drink. I will say nothing more. But let me share this. This man was a sweetheart, meek, loving, caring spirit. He reached out to folks nobody else paid attention to. He didn't have a big eye and little you mentality. He loved with the love of God. But he had that problem, mainly because the woman he lived with was hard to live with. And you, and you could see it in the church by the way she treated people. And I said, if she's like this at church, what must she be like at home? But he was caring and merciful, forgiving. I mean, all of the above. So she, this friend of mine was praying for him. And she said, Lord, I feel like I'm wasting my time. That man ain't trying. That man is sitting up there. You know, he, he 
I mean, how long does it take for a person to get over something? Come on. I mean, after all, I mean, when I stopped, I stopped this. And when I, and she was going down the list of, of everybody she knew, including herself, that, you know, got over stuff because the Lord gave him the victory. This is what the Lord did. He interrupted her speech with his audible voice. And he told her, which shut her mouth for good. You see him as failing and failing. I see him as trying and trying. So some of the folks you're looking down on because they can't get their paperwork straight. Some of the folks you're looking down on because they can't seem to get the instructions lined up right and they do it wrong every time. The timing is off. Their schedule is off. They seem to be under a cloud of confusion with everything they do. While you're judging them as a failure, God is judging them as a person who is trying and trying and trying, trying to get it right. They're, they're, they're trying to reach beyond themselves, beyond their mental capacity, beyond their limits. They may have a hard time understanding things. They may have a, a lack of coordination with their thought processes. God straightened me out too about that. Don't judge now. Be careful. You know, you're on thin ice. Don't go there. And I backed up my game, asked the Lord to forgive me and give me patience and understanding. We all can fall into that, but we have to constantly throw it before God so that he can keep us straight. Why? Because he said judgment must first begin at the house of God. I do not want God to pour passing judgment on me because I'm judging someone else in the body of Christ. Do you? Do you want him doing that to you? So constantly ask God to keep your spirit clean, your motive clean, your attitude pure. Hmm. Yeah, without presumption, without passing judgment, without that level of intolerance that says, hmm, no way, Jose. I know they don't mean, I know they don't mean nothing. I know they're sitting up there faking and, and, and slip sliding. No, 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 no. You keep the attitude and your opinions to yourself and take the concern to God. That's the way you handle that. And that will eliminate that mold from growing in your Petri dish, your proverbial Petri dish. That'll stop that mold from growing in your spirit. That'll stop others from being defiled, many being defiled because of the bitterness that's lodged in your heart. Not only the bitterness, the resentment, not only the resentment, the judgment, not only the judgment, the intolerance, the impatience. Hello. The list goes on and on ad infinitum, does it not, when you're dealing with the sinfulness of man's heart. So let's try to stay under the living water of God so he can constantly bathe our spirits and our minds clean. And stay away from those nasty spirited people. Stay away from those abusive people. You don't want their ways rubbing off on you. You don't want to end up getting bitterness in your heart because you've been around a contaminated person so long that now you're stuck. No, you don't want to do that. So you stay around the pure. You stay around the merciful. You stay around the loving. Stay in God's face. Stay in his word. Now, if you don't have time to read his word, you don't have time to read the stuff in your job because the stuff in God's word is way more important than what you need to read on your job. Amen. God bless you. Ask God to cleanse you. Clean me from all unrighteousness. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my Redeemer. Amen. God bless you. It is an area of prayer. You must pray on these things. You must confess your faults. That's how you get clean. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Don't we want to be free from all the contaminants of the sin? Yes, we do. I know I do. I don't know about you, but I do. All right. God bless you. Okay.
for the people who don't know, I, I'm getting writings from God, and uh, the one that I got this morning just happens to coincide with what uh, Pat spoke about uh, just now. And let me interject right here. The name of Lynn's channel is Holy Spirit News with a candle. Okay, go on. With a candle. It's on YouTube. Yes. Okay, it's called Our Temples Get Gummed Up With Sin. Ah! Most of us... <laughs> okay. Most of us do not realize that God lives within us. Our bodies uh, start out as temples of God. If we pollute these bodies, we are harming the God that lives within us. Any fornication done out of wedlock is a physical affront to our temple. God expects us to keep our temples clean and free of sins of all kinds. As our temples get gummed up with various sins, we are unable to work properly. We were not designed for sins to be part of us. Anytime sins are introduced to the body, certain aspects of that body lose functionality. It will not work like it was designed. Keep free of sin and get yourself back to full uh, get yourself back to full soul optimal function. <laughs> Rebuke all <laughs> again, get yourself back to full soul optimal function function. Yep. Rebuke all sins, repent, and do not go back to these sins. Look at that. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> and that's why we call us twins. Yeah. Isn't that funny? <laughs> that is beautiful. I love it. Um.